Hello, everybody, and welcome to my first recorded lecture. It's kind of weird speaking to a screen and not speaking to you guys, but we'll try to make it work. Um, so again, tomorrow's class um, not going to happen, so we get this instead. And I'm going to try to sum up everything I was going to say in about 20, 30 minutes uh, to make it quicker. Um, so I'm just going to kind of touch on some of the important parts. This is really for an introduction to uh, the New Testament and an introduction to the epistles, a little bit about what they are, and as we go forward, um, what to expect. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in. All right, so <clears throat> you guys have covered a lot these past six months. Like, we've studied so much, 40 out of the 66 books of the Bible. You guys are almost there um, as we jump now in the third quarter. Uh, and during that time, you guys have studied over 2,000 years of history. You've seen the rising and falling of many different powerful empires. You see this ever-changing and shaping world, um, a world that's riddled with injustice, selfishness, greed, hate, wickedness, sinfulness of all kinds. Uh, the world that was created for a good purpose, um, but was twisted and ruined by the sinful heart of man. And a world that's in complete darkness and blinded a true light. And it's in this world, this broken world, that the creator of it all decides to make a promise. And he makes a promise with this man, Abraham. And a promise that one day he would transform and bless the world through a singular offspring. And we got to watch as God spent the next 2,000 years bringing about the fulfillment of that promise. Transforming one nation, or one family into a whole nation. And a, a nation that was meant to be a beacon of light to the world. And however we watched that for 2,000 years, that nation failed miserably time and time and time again. They were really unable to overcome the underlying problem of sin. And... Yet, when all seemed lost, when the nation was destroyed, overthrown, set afire, there was a small glimmer of hope. And we continually saw through the prophets this small glimmer of hope coming up again and again, this hope that one day God would cleanse humankind. One day he would cleanse the, the, our hearts of sinfulness. And for six months, you guys have been waiting eagerly for that coming hope, for the fulfillment of that hope for the appearance of branch man. And we finally got to witness that fulfillment take the shape of a cross. We finally got to see sin get conquered through the power, not through the power of a mighty army, not in the way that we expected to, but sin was conquered through humility and love. A love so profound, a love so great, a love in the shape of a cross. The promises were fulfilled, and the nations and the world was blessed by the very Son of God, Jesus Christ, hanging on a cross, dying for the sins of the world, and defeating the grave. And the promise that established a mighty, everlasting kingdom here on earth. Uh, and this is where we now stand, in our study of the greatest story ever told. And you guys have seen a lot these past six months. You've grown probably more than you ever imagined you would would learn more about God than you ever thought possible. But guess what? It's not even close to over yet. Because the greatest story ever told doesn't end with Jesus on the cross. The beginning of eternity doesn't begin at creation. It begins at the cross. For the eternal kingdom of God was established at the cross. It was the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the ascension to the right hand of the Father that brought forgiveness, life, and immortality. So don't think that we're at the end of things with this quarter. We're actually with this quarter finally at the beginning of the story. Because Jesus said that the kingdom of God was like a mustard seed, right? This tiny little seed that was planted in the ground, starting out as this, one of the smallest of all seeds, but growing to this large, large tree. And Jesus was that seed which died and was buried, but with his death brought new life, a tree that we're all a part of. And Daniel described the kingdom as this stone not cut by human hands that crushed all other kingdoms and when established grows into this massive mountain. The kingdom of God is living, active, and therefore growing. That is what this quarter is all about. 
getting to see the kingdom of God grow from a small stone to a giant mountain, a mountain that we call the church, which was started by Jesus and spread across the whole world through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the feet of his disciples. And that's where we're at now as, as we get into things and we start moving into this quarter. And so what I want to do now is just kind of give a little bit of an overview of what we're going to be looking at this quarter, a little bit of an overview of the uh, New Testament and the epistles and what they are. Um, and so just like the Old Testament, how Kings and Chronicles are really that backbone of all the prophets, so the book of Acts is the backbone to all the epistles. Uh, they all fit in somewhere in line along that timeline. So let's just take a little look um, at the timeline here. And so as you can see, um, really what we've looked at so far is somewhere around 4 BC to about 30 AD is the life and ministry and death of Jesus. right? And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, they were written later, but the, the, the time, their historical narratives, New Testament narratives, and the, his, the history that they cover is really that period from 4 B.C. to 30 A.D. Right? That's what they're concerned with, and it's really the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And then as you kind of see forward there, the book of Acts covers right after that, 40 days after that, as they're waiting in the upper room for the Holy Spirit to come down, all the way up to about 62 A.D., with the imprisonment of Paul in Rome. And so the book of Acts covers about 30, 32 years in that, in that time frame. Its main focus is going to be on specifically Peter and mainly on Paul. Um, and it's going to cover their two ministries and really heavily focus on the ministry and missions of Paul, him planning the churches and who he was involved with and everything that went down with him there. Um, and it's during this time, from about 31 to 62, really about, about, from the 40s to about 62 AD, is when we get majority of the Pauline epistles. Um, this is where we see Galatians, uh, 1 and 2 Corinthians written, um, Thessalonians will be written, um, you'll get Romans written during this time. You also get the general epistles written during this time. This is like Hebrews and James um, will be written during this time, Jude are going to be written at, uh, d during this time frame. And, and really during this time frame, what marked this was the spread of the gospel. This was th the spread of the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, the planning of the churches, really the going out, the, the start of that Great Commission is what this time frame marks. And then just ahead of that, you see the 64 to 72, day, 72 AD. This is really marked by a period of heavy persecution. Um, it's during this time that uh, Paul is imprisoned a second time in Rome, a much harsher t uh, time. Many of the disciples, uh, Peter and Paul, are killed during this time, during this heavy persecution. Um, uh, in Rome, Christians are being burned alive. They're being, I don't know if you guys just recently watched that the uh, Paul the Apostle movie. Um, it kind of highlighted, it was 67, 80, highlighted some of the Neronian persecution. Um, I think that was very subtle. It was a lot worse than what that movie showed if you watched it. Um, you know, Christians, and it's mainly just in Rome here, Christians are being heavily persecuted, and so they're e either leaving Rome or dying for the cause. And so this period is really marked by persecution. What you have here is what's known as the, the prison epistles. is like 2 Timothy, um, Colossians, and Philemon. Um, are, are being writ during, written during this time by Paul, and a lot of their emphasis is on um, enduring the faith during persecution. You're gonna, there's going to be some, and, and also um, fighting against false teachings, because this is really at Paul's end of his life. Um, and then also this is when Revelation is written, um, a, a little bit before this time. Um, not in the 90s, as maybe Stephen will say, um, but, you know, around this time. And... It will, it, it, and because a big focus again is persecution. Um, it's being written to a persecuted church, and it's um, really the the emphasis here is the, the the victory of Christ in all persecutions, the victory of Christ. And so, um, this is really what marks this time period. Um, we also see in 70 A.D. the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D., um, and then the continued Jewish-Roman war about till 72 A.D. Um, is when that kind of came to a complete closure. 
And so that time period is marked in there, uh, and we'll find a couple of epistles and revelation written during that time. And then after that, what you have is you just have this continued growth of the church, really the second generation carrying on the church. Um, people like Timothy and Titus go on to be the church leaders because almost all of the disciples have died off, all the first generation except for John. And it's at the latter half of this section where you will, we'll get the epistles of John and the gospel of John. Um, and John lives a nice long life um, and, uh, and he ends up dying in, a, in Ephesus there. Um, but that's kind of just uh, a broad stroke of what we're going to be looking at um, over this next quarter. Uh, and, and again, really, the New Testament only, only covers about 70 years uh, of time. It really only focuses in on about 40 of those years. Um, you know, the Gospels, again, they, they cover th about 30 years or so. Uh, but really, their main focus is the, th the three years of ministry of Jesus and then his his death and resurrection and so really the Gospels focus in on three years um, the Acts of the Apostles cover um, about 32 years um, heavily focused more towards the latter half of, of Paul's missionary journeys and Paul's life um, but those only cover about one generation um, of time span and so again when we're looking at the New Testament we got to understand whereas the Old Testament we see this the span of thousands of years, generation after generation after generation after generation. And one of the big questions that we see with the Old Testament is why is there so much harsh judgment in the Old Testament and so little in the New Testament? Well, the big reason is because the Old Testament covers many, many generations, while the New Testament really only covers one generation. Um, and so just kind of keeping that in mind as we step into here, um, where a big difference here is we're, we're, coming, we're covering a very limited amount of time compared uh, to the Old Testament. And so just a, just a reminder of what the world that we're stepping into um, in this first century A.D. Um, with the Gospels and with specifically the Epistles. It's just a reminder. I know Mark Smith covered a lot of this, and so you can kind of go back to some of those notes. But just a reminder, again, the world um, is all across the Roman Empire. There's Jewish synagogues and settlements. Um, and a Jewish synagogue, really what it was, was just if you had requirements, if you had 10 Jewish males meeting together, that was called synagogue. could be at a person's house, um, in richer areas where there was a, a larger group of, of, um, of Jewish communities. They would actually have specific buildings they called synagogues where they would meet. Uh, but really, it was just a meeting of 10 or more Jewish males. Um, and so there's synagogues all over the Roman world. There's a common language of Greek, the Koine Greek, which um, everybody knew. Um, again, the, the New Testament people, Jesus and all the, all the Jews surrounding him, his disciples, and all those going out, they spoke Greek mainly because um, that was the trade language, especially when Paul's going out on his missionary journeys. He's speaking Greek to everybody. Maybe when he goes into synagogues, he might speak Hebrew or Aramaic, but mainly he's speaking Greek. Um, and then also, again, remember we have the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, um, which was put together in the second, around the second century BC. Um, and so the, the the Old Testament that the the Jewish or the New Testament authors that Jesus, the Old Testament that they're going to be reading and they're going to be um, quoting from is going to be the Septuagint, not the Hebrew Bible. And so sometimes we'll come into, uh, we'll look at quotations from our New Testament, and it'll be like, and then we'll look at the quotation in the Old Testament, and be like, how come these don't match up? They're actually, there's a couple words different here, and they don't really, sometimes it'll be like, this is a way different quote. It's because in our Old Testaments, in our Bibles, where those are translated from the Hebrew Old Testament, where in the Greek, or in the New Testament, when the authors quote the Old Testament, they're actually quoting the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, right? And so that's why sometimes there might be a couple words that are different. But again, this is the world that they're going into. Um, also, <clears throat> there's widespread peace across Rome. Remember the Pax Augusta or the Pax Romana, peace of Rome. And so for a couple hundred years, there was no war. Everything was peace. There were little revolts here and there. Um, like we have with um, in, in Jerusalem in 70 AD. Um, however, they were quickly put down by the Romans, and so the Romans, peace at all costs, even by force, right? But for the most part, there's, there's peace. Everybody wants peace. Nobody's trying to revolt against Rome. Um, <clears throat> also, what we see is um, the Romans um, did away with uh, pirates at sea, and so sea travel was very, oops, 
sea travel was very um, uh, safe at this time. Uh, and also, there were the Roman roads were set up, and so the travel by road was a lot quicker, safer, easier, and more efficient. And so what you have is you really have this kind of this perfect, as, as in, in Galatians 4, it talks about the, the fullness of time. And I remember Mark Smith was saying this, like, Jesus came at this perfect time, right, where all these things were lined up for the gospel to spread in a way that it couldn't in any other time. And, uh, and so this is the world that we're looking at. And this is the world that, that Jesus is brought into, that Paul and Peter are come into, that the New Testament is written into. And so we got to be thinking both Hebrew, so we got to have Old Testament in mind, but we also got to be thinking Greek and Greek philosophy. And so as we get into some of these epistles, we're going to look at some of the Greek philosophies at the time and how that influenced their mindset and how it influenced their writings. Um, and so one of the questions that kind of comes in with the, that the first church had to face um, is, right, okay, so Christianity, it starts out as Jesus, who is a Jewish Messiah, right? He's the Jewish Messiah. He's the fulfillment of the Old Testament, right? Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. But I came to fulfill the law and the prophets. So Jesus is the, is the fulfillment of the promise of Abraham. And so Christians are actually a fulfillment of Judaism. They're the true Jews, right, at, you know, at the very beginning. Because if, if Jesus is the actual fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise, then who's, off, who's going off course? Who's actually following the, false, the falseness? Those who follow Jesus or the Jews who continued in their old traditions and rejected Jesus, right? Who's walking down a false path? It's not the Christians. It's not those who follow Christ. It's those who reject Christ Whole, the Jews that reject Christ, right? So what you begin to have is you begin to have this split within Judaism. You have Messianic Jews who follow the Messiah, and then you have Jews who reject the Messiah. And at this time, they're not called Christians. At this time, the Christianity, they just refer to themselves as the way, and we'll get to that when we get to Acts. But and so what begins to have to happen is these questions start to arise because at the beginning of Christianity, it was all Jews, right? In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes down. They're, everybody that's there, they're all Jews, right? So the, the, the beginning of Christianity, the first church for the first couple of years were only Jews. No Gentiles were included in. Um, and then we have, the, we have the story in Acts with Peter. He goes to, uh, he goes to Cornelius' house and he sees the sheet. And that's where God says, hey, don't call unclean what I have deemed clean. He realized, oh, he's talking about the Gentiles. Wait a minute. The, this, this whole movement, Jesus' movement, isn't just for the Jews. It's for the Gentiles as well. And, and all of a sudden, some of the people, Peter kind of struggled with it. Paul took to it, and he, he just went out and started preaching Gentile inclusion, Gentile inclusion. I mean, that, that was his gospel, right? But, it kind of, we, all this, but not everybody was so readily to accept the Gentile inclusion, a lot of Jews were like, hey, wait a minute, no, we don't want these filthy Jews or these filthy Gentiles in, you know. And so the question, the first question, and the first problem of the church arose was the Gentile inclusion. Do Gentiles first need to become Jews to become Christians, right? Because since the beginning of the Old Testament, people from foreign nations could become Jews. It was called, they were called proselytes. It was a conversion into Judaism, not by birth, right? You were birthed into another nation, but you could become a Jewish proselyte. And, and as, as you can see here, the process for that in the Old Testament was that to become a Jew, you would repent of sins of your old life, you'd agree to uphold the law, you'd undergo baptism or repentance, right? So baptism isn't a New Testament thing. Baptism goes all the way back to Exodus 24, um, right? We see um, even Moses... Right, they would be sprinkled before they would be sprinkled with the blood. They'd, they'd be immersed in water. So many times you see that immersed, they'd be immersed or emerged. It's talking about being immersed in water. Uh, I'm pretty. I, I remember uh, Mark Smith was talking about the mikvah oaths, where there are these baths that the Jews would dip in for ritual cleansing. Right. So baptism was a ritual cleansing that they would go through, and to become a Jew, you would go through this ritual cleansing, this baptism of water. Right, and it would cleanse you, it would make you clean. Right? So you'd go undergo baptism of water, 
you'd become circumcised, and then you'd adopt the tribe of Israel. And this is what a pros or this is what a Gentile would go through to become a proselyte, and they would be a full Jew, right? Um, and they would take on a tribe. <clears throat> there were also what was known as God fearers who wanted to become a Jew. They wanted to recognize that there's only one God, Yahweh. They wanted to follow the law. They just didn't want to fully follow everything like circumcision or eating bacon, not being able to eat bacon. Um, and so they were known as God fears, and we'll come across those in the New Testament as well. Um, but essentially, this is the first problem that arises. And so a lot of the earlier um, epistles will deal with this issue. Galatians, Galatians heavily deals with this issue. It's one of the first epistles written, and it's all about Paul saying, listen, guys, there is, there is, what are you doing with this disunity between not allowing Gentiles in um, and not allowing and forcing them to be circumcised, you know, we're not, this, it's not a true circumcision of the flesh that makes us a true Jew. It's a circ true sort of circumcision of the heart that makes us a true Jew, right? So we're going to cover a, a, a much of the content of those earlier epistles are going to be focused on the Gentile inclusion because that's what Paul is all about. Like in Ephesians, he talks about the mystery of, of my uh, gospel, the mystery of Christ is Gentile inclusion, right? That's the great mystery of Christ, right? So he's going to, have to cover a lot of that. So again, as you get into this, be thinking, okay, a big issue, Gentile inclusion. Um, and what this eventually, what this actually led into is because there were a lot of Jews that were upset uh, against, first of all, they were upset against Christianity, but they were more upset about Gentiles being allowed into the promises of God without being circumcised. And without being cleansed, um, and so one of the first problems that the church had to face were Jewish false teachers, and we'll see in uh, in Acts and or in uh, Galatians and Philippians, Paul talks about he's going to combat these false teachers, and they're called Judaizers, um, and they were Jews that followed behind a, behind a, the apostles, specifically Paul to try to unteach everything they teach. So, right, Paul would go somewhere, he'd speak in the synagogues, he'd speak to the Gentiles, he'd plant a church, he'd work with them for anywhere from a, a couple weeks to two years. He'd then move on to a new place, and these Jews would come in behind him and be like, hey, you guys just had Paul, but he didn't give you the full gospel. We're here to bring you the full gospel. Actually, if you want to become a Christian, the first thing you need to do is you need to be get circumcised, and you need to become a Jew first, and you need to follow, to follow the dietary laws. And essentially, they would try to convert them into Judaism and try to negate everything Paul taught. Right. And so this was a big issue with that first church, where false teachers coming in and unteaching everything Paul taught. Um, that's one of the things Paul will Paul will say is. If anybody teaches anything, right, in Galatians, if anybody teaches anything different than the gospel that I preach, let him be accursed. Even if an angel comes down and teaches a different gospel, let him be accursed, right? Because this was a major issue. So again, as you're going through the epistles, have this in your mind, as you, um, false teaching by Jews. Um, uh, the, the next problem this whole issue brought into the church, um, another major part, was dismute, disunity. Again, the Jews were very unhappy with these unhappy with these filthy, uncircumcised Gentiles being considered into the kingdom, and so they were considered less, right? The Jews, right, so you'd have a Christian church made up of Jews and Gentiles, right? They're all Christian, but there's Jews and Gentiles, and they did not get along. The Jews were very upset at the Gentiles. They thought them less than filthy, uncircumcised, dirty Gentiles, right? They had this, this prejudice against the, the Gentiles. And so what that happened to the Gentiles is then the Gentiles viewed the Jews as, well, they became prejudiced and, and racist against the Jews and be like, well, you guys are, um, you're too legalistic. And you know what? You guys have already been cut off, right? You've been cut off from the promises. It's our time now. This actually isn't for you. Um, we're, the, we're the true people of God. You guys missed your chance. And it just caused this chasm between Jews and Gentiles within the church, and there was disunity all across um, the church. And so, we'll heavily, Paul, uh, Paul will touch on this heavily in Galatians and heavily in Romans. Um, as you can see there, right, in Romans 11, it says, Some of the branches broken off of you, uh, and you were grafted in. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. He's talking to the Gentiles here. Don't be arrogant toward the branches. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. Do not become proud, but fear, for 
it, if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare it, right? So he's saying that Jews have been, some of the Jews, not all the Jews, some of the Jews have been broken off so that you Gentiles could be grafted in. So don't be arrogant and prideful and think you're better than the Jews, right? And so, and again in Galatians, we can see there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, male nor free, female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Why does he have to say that, right? Why, again, epistles, so just something about the epistles, their responses to problems and issues, right? If there weren't any issues in the, in the first church, there'd be no epistles, right? And so a lot of times, <clears throat> side note, a lot of times um, people today will be like, oh, we just need to go back to the first church. The first church was so pure and so great and so wonderful. They did everything perfect. And it's like, no, if they did everything perfect, we'd have no epistles. The reasons we have epistles is because they were completely screwed up. They were disunified. They were all sorts of wacky. They had all sorts of problems. They were, they were not great. They were just starting off and they were they had so many problems, right? So again, just like the Israelites, when they first became a nation, they went through a lot of problems. The Christians, when they first became a church, they went through a lot of problems. And guess what? For the past 2,000 years, we've had problems in the church, and we still do today. Um, but thankfully, we have the epistles to guide us and lead us, right? And so again, one of the major problems was disunity in the church, and that's why Paul has to write, hey, there's neither Jew nor Greek, Jew nor Gentile. You're all one in Christ, right? So stop being disunified. Stop thinking you Jews are better than you Gentiles, or you Gentiles are better than you Jews, right? And so, again, major disunity within the church. And so, again, what this disunity started to breed was the as Gentiles, the church became was starting to become more and more Gentile and less and less Jew, right? Um, because more and more Gentiles would come in, and they would be like, hey, we don't want, want these dietary laws. We don't need to celebrate these festivals. We don't need to celebrate all this stuff. Um, we don't need to follow the sacrificial stuff. Like, that's not for us. It's for you Jews. You know, we don't need that. We just follow Jesus. And so more and more, the church began to get this at environment and atmosphere of very Gentile and Greek. And what happened was, because of that, the Gentiles and the Greeks started to bring in Greek philosophy and Greek thinking. And this led to the next big problem that we're going to see that the epistles heavily um, um, deal with is false Gentile teachers and syncretism. And so, again, thinking about the Gentiles, they come from a polytheistic bath background, right? They believe in the Greek pantheon, the Roman pantheon, um, all, many, many different gods, right? If one god's good, then many gods are great, right? So it's similar to the original Israelites coming out of Egypt, and coming through the wilderness, what Moses had to go through, Paul has to go through, right? So think about that. Paul is, again, I know Jesus is the new Moses, but Paul is, is like a Moses. He has to deal with these Gentiles and be like, hey, stop worshiping these other gods. Stop worshiping these idols. Hey, stop sleeping around. Hey, stop doing this. Hey, stop stealing from each other. Hey, don't kill each other. Hey, you shouldn't do this. Hey, you shouldn't do that, right? When dealing with the, with the Jews... They're already morally pure, right? They, Paul doesn't need to correct their morals in the sense of they're not, they're not committing adultery. They're not worshiping other idols. They're not killing each other, and they're not stealing from each other for the most part, right? They understand the law of God. They understand the morality of God. They understand the ethics of God. Gentiles do not whatsoever, right? So the Gentiles had a lot further to go, right? The Jews were just kind of right there. They were awaiting the Messiah. That's why Paul would go into the synagogues when he first come into a city because they're already awaiting the Messiah. He'd go in and be like, hey, Jesus is the Messiah. They're like, oh, great, boom. And they're already super Christians because they're like, hey, we already follow God with our whole heart. Now we just understand that our salvation comes through Jesus. And they would then just shift over to Jesus and they wouldn't have to correct all this garbage that had been going, you know, this, this stuff that had been going on for so long, right? They weren't perfect, but the Gentiles had a lot longer to go. And many of us probably relate more with the Gentiles because we, many of us, maybe live a life um, not so morally pure or morally clean, right? And so this is what Paul's having to deal with, is just transforming um, all these Gentiles. Um, it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's like Paul and all the apostles, they had to herd a bunch of cats who were all in heat. It's, it's an interesting image, but just imagine that image, and that's what discipling the Gentiles is like. Um, 
And so, and, and, but in the midst of all that, right, in the midst of trying to just disciple people, um, there's also all these false teachers coming in who would mix in Roman and Greek philosophies and Greek religion and Roman religion, mix in with Christianity, and you got this a lot of weird, weird stuff. It's called syncretism, and essentially it's a um, Christianity. Of course, I'm a Christian, but you know I take a little bit of Buddhism, and I take a little bit of, of Islam, and I take a little bit of uh, New Age mysticism, and I just mesh it together, and you know I'm still a Christian. And that kind of stuff was going on since the very first church, and people would... Um, involve worship of their gods or they involve just dualism which is the idea that the physical is bad and the spiritual is good and so you know you would deny your flesh and you would either abuse yourself or you would deny yourself I mean even the like um, the idea of I'm gonna deny myself food um, and any pleasures of life because if I deny my flesh I'll become more spiritual right this is a Greek philosophy this, this Platonism it's not Christianity. It's not biblical. Um, but this started to creep into the church, this idea that, that the, the physical and the spiritual are two separate things and that God is spiritual, not physical, not fleshly. And so then all of a sudden what happens is, is the idea that how could God, who is spiritual, who is good, become flesh, which is evil and bad? And so then all of a sudden this, these teachings of Jesus would come in, that Jesus um, – wasn't he never actually wasn't a human he was just a phantom this spiritual phantom that really what he wasn't he wasn't human or they would do the opposite that Jesus was just a man he wasn't actually divine um, and the Holy Spirit didn't actually indwell with him it just kind of hovered over him and taught him stuff um, and a lot of weird wacky teachings came about about Jesus and so again Paul's not only having to disciple all these just these just these just wild animals He's having to correct all these false teachings. He's like, listen, guys, I just, like to the Galatians, he's like, I'm so I'm so shocked at how quickly you've turned from the gospel, which you were so readily ready to, to follow. He's like, I preached the gospel. You got it. You were on fire. And then here it's been a couple months, and I and, I, and now I get these words that you, you've been bewitched and changed by these false teachings. These false teachers who claim to be Christians come in and give you these different teachings about the gospel, and you're just like, yep, that sounds great to me, and you follow it. And Paul's like, what's wrong with you? Like, I, I don't understand it. Like, why won't you just follow what I told you to do, and why are you following these false teachers? Um, and that's, again, that's where he says, like, if anybody teaches a gospel that's different than the one that I we've taught you at first, even if it's an angel, even if an angel comes to you, right? Because a lot of what was happening is a lot of these um, supposed prophets and teachers would come in and say, hey, I know Paul taught you this. However, I had a visitation from an angel, right? And angels are spiritual, and so they have a greater revelation about God um, than us humans. Um, so I had a visitation from an angel, and this is what an angel told me. So I'm a credit. You should believe what I said because an angel told me, right? And, and this kind of stuff still goes on today, right? And so that's why Paul specifically says, even if an angel preach gives you a message of a gospel that's different than the one I preached. Let that angel be accursed. Do not follow that message. Do not listen to it. Run from it and follow the true gospel. Because what do we have here? Um, again, this kind of stuff still goes on today. The idea of Mormonism. What is Mormonism? Mormonism is Christianity with an added gospel given by an angel. Right? So um, Joseph Smith is visited by an angel. The angel gives you, hey, I, I know you have the Bible, but I have a new and greater revelation about Jesus, and here it is, right? Mormonism, right? So, that's, so that stuff goes on today. It was going on back then. So again, just because an angel speaks to you, even if an angel does come to you, let's say tomorrow night, and all of a sudden you get a visitation by an angel, an angel starts telling you something that's different than what the Bible says. You say, sorry, angel, I know the truth, and you're not from the Lord. Because just because you get an angel doesn't mean that it's going to be from the Lord. Anyways, so th this this same issue was going on with the first church. Paul had to battle against false teachings. And so again, as we jump into the epistles and you're going through these epistles, you're going to come across this. But you want to keep this in context, right? Okay, he's combating false teachers. He has false teachers coming in. Maybe this is why he's saying these things. <clears throat> um, and... and and just the kind of the last big problem that I want to touch on that, that the church faced that a lot of the um, epistles will face that or that will touch on that most of us have never dealt with in our life. Some of you guys, I know you have. 
but the majority of us, especially who come from America or a lot of the Western cultures, we haven't dealt with this whatsoever, and that's persecution. Um, the early church faced legitimate persecution where they were being killed, beaten, kicked out of their homes, loss of property. Um, uh, at first, persecution started, but it was actually the Jews that persecuted the Christians and some local Gentiles, depending on the area. <clears throat> like you'll see this in Acts when you get to Ephesus. Um, uh, some of the, the idol makers are in an uproar about Paul. Paul's like beaten, like every city he goes to, he's beaten. He's beaten to the point of death, right? It's some, you're going to see some crazy stuff about Paul and all these apostles. But, the, but it started out with just, just localized persecutions, mainly by the Jews, right? The, and, and we see that in the very beginning of Acts, the spread of the, and what's crazy is the spread of the gospel happened because of persecution, right? The spread of the gospel comes by the blood of the saints. Um, but again, there was, but again, it was mainly um, Jewish persecution against Christians with some localized persecution until 64 AD where Nero burns Rome and he blames it on the Christians. And then you have the Neronian persecution for about four years. And this was like, the most intense, intense persecution ever. Again, the the movie uh, Paul touched on this. It 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 kind of scratched the surface of how bad it actually was. Um, but this was only localized to Rome. This didn't really happen outside of Rome. Maybe a little bit, some places kind of followed, but m mostly this was just localized to Rome. Um, but again, for the first, for the beginning of the church, they always suffered persecution, legitimate persecution. I'm not talking about like. Oh, somebody called me a mean thing on the internet, or I posted something and somebody said, I don't believe in God, you're stupid for believing God. That's not persecution, right? I'm sorry. I hear that stuff all the time. On a regular basis, I get told I'm an idiot for believing Christianity. That's not persecution. Persecution is where you are ripped from your homes, your families are ripped from you, you are rejected by your family, you're rejected by people like legitimately kicked out of your home. Um, you're chased out of your town, you're chased out of wherever, you're beaten, you're imprisoned. That's legitimate persecution. Um, I've heard a lot of people say like, oh man, I'm just dealing with persecution, man. These people, or I went to preach the gospel and you know, somebody somebody said stuff to me or somebody pushed me or somebody, they just, they just, they offended me. I got offended, so I'm facing persecution. If you get offended, that's your fault, right? Don't get offended. You're preaching the gospel. You're, the gospel is offensive to the world. Anyways, I could go on a rant about that. Now I'm trying to say, um, this, that they, they've suffered legitimate persecution. I know some of you guys in our class have suffered, suffered legitimate persecution. And so like you will understand and relate more to these letters when these letters talk about enduring the, with the faith, running the good race, right? I, I ran the race. I fought the good fight. Um, <clears throat> like this is, this is Paul is thinking in the midst of persecution, right? He, he's seen this as a war, as a battle, because he's being beaten on the daily. He's being attacked and chased out of the towns on daily. You know, a lot of us say, like, oh, man, I'm just fighting the good fight because, you know, um, my, my Netflix went down or the Wi-Fi is down. I'm just fighting the good fight. Um, but, sorry, I keep getting on this. This is something that just really bothers me. <laughs> Anyways, so for, for just keeping... <laughs> Um, just, just keeping in mind, um, as you go through the epistles, a lot of this, you got to think of the t mindset, they're going through heavy persecution. Um, and, and sometimes to accept Christianity meant you were rejected by your family and you were rejected by your friends, you were rejected by your community. And, and the, er, the first church, the reason they shared everything together, the reason they were so close is because if you, if you, if you accepted Christianity, you were rejected by your own community and you had no community. It's kind of like I'm out on the streets now. Um, if you're a, if you're a woman, a married woman, let's say, and you become a Christian, your husband's not, he's not going to like that you're denying and rejecting the gods. And so all of a sudden you have this secret community that, 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 that are there to pray for you and to give you food if you're kicked out of your home, right? So the church during this time was so needed because it was, it was a community for those that were going to be rejected by the world. Um, today it's, it's much different. And, and today, we, again, we go, hey, let's go back to the first church. Well, most of us don't for, suffer persecution, and so church, it, it's become a different thing because it's not needed in the same way. If we were heavily persecuted, then we would need the church in the same way that uh, the early apostles and the early Christians did. Um, so again, just <clears throat> think persecution as we go through these epistles and um, context, right? They are, they are facing persecution every single day. So 
Again, um, just to kind of summarize kind of what an epistle is. And so, you know, thinking about Paul is going out and Peter, they're going out and um, planning these churches, and then they leave. Well, how do you continue discipleship, right? You don't have emails, you, don't have, you can't call them up, you can't Skype them, you can't even really, you know, um, uh, you, there's, I mean, there's so much you can't do. So how do you continue discipleship if you're continuing on a missionary journey? Well, you write letters. Um, and so the epistles, which just means letter, it's one of the main reasons is discipleship of the churches from a distance. It encourages the churches. It's focused on giving understanding to the Old Testament, right? And so a lot of the stuff, the a lot of the stuff in the epistles, it's not new theology in the sense that it's we're not seeing new stuff here. We're just seeing a, a greater understanding of the Old Testament. All right, so it's great that you guys have done the Old Testament already. Now that we jump into the epistles, you're going to understand all this stuff way more because the epistles is just, it's the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus, right? Chronological. <laughs> Chronological, yes. Right? So the, 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 the epistles are just essentially taking a lens, and that lens is Jesus, and then you're going to look at the Old Testament now. Um, and that's what Paul's doing. He's just saying, hey, guys, I'm not saying anything new here. We've known this from the Old Testament. We've known this from ever. It's just now completed in Jesus, right? Um, so you guys, it, it, you guys are going to understand the epistles in a way that n many people just can't, because you're going to have an understanding of the Old Testament. Um, and again, these these letters are meant to be circulated throughout the churches. Uh, usually, they have one church in mind when he, when they write this, um, but it's also meant. We'll see this in Colossians where he says, "Hey." Take this letter, share it with the church in Laodicea, and also grab the church's their letter and, and read it among your congregation. Um, and so usually it's written to a congregation. Sometimes it'll be written to a specific person, um, like the letters to Timothy or the letter to Titus. Uh, but most of the time they're written to a whole congregation. Sometimes they're in response to another letter, like we see uh, Corinthians, <clears throat> First and Second Corinthians. Is actually we know there were other uh, letters to the Corinthians. We've just never found them because. Paul talks about how in your letter you said this. And so Paul Paul's letter is actually a response to a letter he received and as well a response to uh, information that Chloe comes and brings him information. He says, hey, based off what Chloe said, you, I know you had some questions. And so it's Paul answering questions that the church had. It's addressing issues that he's heard from Chloe or these other people that are saying, hey, this is going on in the church. And he's like, okay, I need to write a letter. And it's also to encourage the churches and just to disciple them in greater ways. Right, so that's the point of the epistle. Um, so again, if there weren't problems in the churches, then we probably wouldn't have the epistles. But they, what they're meant for is correcting issues. And again, they're not correcting our issues today. They're not dealing with our 21st century issues, our thoughts. They're not answering our questions. They're answering the questions of the first century church. They're dealing with the issues of the first century church. And so we have to keep that in mind. We can't think like we do today, as you guys know this, but we got to think of what were these churches going through at their time. And so just kind of for your homework, looking at as you get into it, um, you know how we have the different structures of uh, the way that the, the, the structure, the horizontals and the books are broken up? Well, mostly what we're going to see in the epistles are going to be topical. They're going to be topical structure. And um, something you haven't seen yet, um, a, new a, a, new system, uh, a new way of structure. You know, we, before we had chronological, biographical. Um, and then in the prophets, we had um, judgment to restoration. Um, well, in the epistles, it's going to be similar. Most of them are going to be written in theology to application, right? So we're going to see, it's like the first three, like Ephesians. First three chapters of Ephesians are, are theology. Paul is correcting their theology. He's, he's giving them a great understanding of who Jesus is, the identity of Christ, our identity in Christ, what God did through Christ, right? It's all theology. And then the next three chapters are all application. All right, based off this, this is what I want you to do. This is how you're supposed to live. This is how you should they should live out, right? So what's great about this and great about the epistles is they're very applicational. They're super easy to, to, to apply to our life, right? Application is going to be some flowing because they do it for us. Paul says, all right, here's what I said, and this is how I want you to apply it, right? So the structure that you're going to do mo mostly within your horizontals for these books are going to be theology to application. You don't want, just like judgment, you don't want to say that, but that's what you're going to be looking for, theology application, and you're mainly going to be looking for topical. Until you get to Aunt James, we don't know about James. James is just a whole other thing. Um, and then also just 
um, when you're observing with these charts, right, every, everything's going to be saying the same, same observation labels, obviously not the profit observation labels, but same observation labels, but you're really going to focus in on the connectives, lots and lots of connectives. Um, really pay attention to um, how the connectives these author of the epistles are using, and don't just say, don't just label connective, but label contrast, result, reason, right? Put the labels in there, and don't just say, you know, reason, because of this, right? What because of this, right? So you want to, you in your observation, really explain the whole thing. Um, I think I have an example here. Do I have an example? No, I don't have an example here. Anyways, um, it's like Romans chapter 8, right? Therefore, we no longer have condemnation for those who are in Christ. For, therefore, those who, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? And we quote that. We say, therefore, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What, what do you, that's a connective. There, whenever you see therefore, you want to ask, what is it there for, right? That, that verse is connected to the whole argument that Paul just made in chapter 7, right? But if you, if you just take chapter 8-1 uh, of Romans and look at that by itself, you'll have no idea what he's talking about, right? So when you're observing that, don't just observe um, um, uh, result, therefore, where there is no condemnation. What is the result to? What is it connecting to, right? So you want to make sure you connect those. Uh, it'll give much greater understanding, right? Because, uh, and again, a lot of what the epistles are is they are arguments, um, not arguments as in fighting back and forth, but arguments as Paul is making logical thoughts. Right? They're very logical. Um, they're very easy to follow if you if you follow them in a logical way. Um, and so, be, and connectives, the connective observation are logical uh, logical observations. And so, just look at the logic of the author and the flow of thought. And when he makes a statement like "therefore there's no no longer condemnation for those in Christ Jesus," what is he? What is he connecting it to? Because that's going to give you the context of that statement. Um, and then also, these are letters. Um, these are personal letters that Paul or um, John or James are writing. And so what is the emotion and tone that he's writing this in, right? What, what, how is he expressing what he's saying? That's actually going to help us to understand the emphasis, right? So em observe the emphasis here um, that's going on. Observe the tone and the emotion um, that is being expressed here. Um <clears throat> And then also, um, for BRI, no more OA, right? There's no more OA in the epistles. There are for the Gospels, but not for the epistles. No more OA, just OR and author and God's redemptive plan, right? And so um, when you're interpreting, uh, you're just going to be interpreting for those things, right? Um, and you're going to interpret for, are you going to get to know Paul? What is, why is the author saying this? Like, think author-wise, think Paul, James, John, and then the OR, and that's why it's, BRI for New Testament, specifically the epistles, BRI is very, 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 very important, right? So make sure you do awesome jobs under BRI. You really want to, when you're looking at this, really get into what is going on with the church. Who is this church? When were they founded? What are their problems? What's going on when this is written? What is Paul trying to address, right? Because if we understand the culture, if we understand the mindset, the philosophy, the previous religions, right? What's going on? If you can really find out, okay, what's going on during that time period in Rome, in Corinth, in Ephesus? And then you see a statement, and you go, oh, wow, that makes a lot more sense based off what was happening at that time, right? So BRI becomes extremely important, so please do not skimp out on your BRIs um, when you're going through the New Testament, specifically the epistles. Um, it's going to greatly, greatly help you to understand um, uh, what's going on, because the epistles, out of more than uh, just, this is the only, really, really mostly out of, out of the whole Bible, the epistles are directly connected to specific events and specific cultural uh, tendencies, right? Because Paul is addressing the church in Ephesus. They're going to be very different than the church in Rome and the church in Corinth, right? They're all going to be different. They're all going to be facing their different um, issues. They're all going to have their different cultural customs. And so when you understand those things, you're going to be able to understand why Paul says the things that he says and why he says them the way that he does, right? So BRI, extremely, extremely important. Um, when you go over those issues, um, or when you go over kind of <clears throat> what are the issues with the church, Are there is it Jew, Gentile, um, just look through that book. Look in the book of Acts when the church was planted um, and try to figure out um, through Acts, the epistles, Bible dictionaries, what are some of the problems that this church is facing at this time? Um, and fill that out as much as you can.
Uh, put verse references. If uh, if you pull these things from different uh, different epistles or the Acts, put verse references um, for uh, the different issues that church is facing um, when you're describing these churches. Um, yeah, and and one last thing, just remember that epistles and what you're looking at is a one-sided conversation. Um, these are all one-sided conversations. What you what we're getting, it would be great if we could see the other side of the conversation, like when Paul writes First Corinthians. What, was, what, what did he hear? What letter did he get? What was the report that he got? Uh, it would help us to understand so much more why he says what he does, but we only get one side of the conversation. So as you jump into these, just remember that. Um, and so just as we go through this quarter, it, we're going to hit heavy, heavy theology. Um, and there's uh, interpretation is going to be popping up. We, so, uh, so our expectation for this quarter, as far as observation interpretation go, we really expect you guys to be putting a lot more into each chart. These books are a lot smaller, right? Some of these are, you know, three chapter, one chapter, six chapters, five chapters, right? Most of these books are a lot smaller, so a lot less charts per book. Um, so we're going to be expecting a lot more interpretations and observations per chart. Um, it's not going to be hard. You could you can start, you could pull out like five interpretations per verse in this stuff, right? Um, <clears throat> don't try to make them super lengthy, full page interpretations. Just be to the point. Um, straight to the point, uh, get your opinion across, throw in the evidence, right? This is, this is the statement I'm making based off, the, here's my question, here's my statement, and here's the evidence for it, right? And just try to, to get in more variety of interpretations, try to uh, across the whole chart, don't just focus on a couple verses, but try to get a breadth of all the verses because there's just so much goodness in there, and so we want you to get a breadth of it. You're not going to be able to get everything, um, but really try to focus on the main key, main points, uh, and get as much as you can um, with them. So... Again, uh, here's, these are just some of the topics that you guys are going to be seeing, and uh, it's an exciting quarter. I'm excited for you guys. Uh, I can't wait for this quarter to, to get rolling and to see just the transformation that's going to come from it. And again, really, um, you know, you guys, I know you guys have been doing it for six months, and it's kind of like it's tiring and it's difficult, but this is the home, the home stretch. Um, this is the time where it's time to kick it into high gear, and you can leave this quarter Right, this this quarter will shape the whole school. Let's say you did amazing the first six months, and then this quarter you just you just kind of like whatever. I'm just gonna be lazy and slack off. You're gonna be extremely disappointed, um, and you're gonna leave regretful. Um, however, maybe you didn't do so well first quarter, second quarter, but if you hit it hard this quarter and you just you just get the best that you can, you're gonna be like, you know what? I could have done a little better, but you know, I I. I third quarter was so amazing for me. I'm just so glad and I'm really leaving with no regret, no regrets because, you know, I got so much out of third quarter and it was so amazing. And, you know, so again, you're going to get SBS is all about you get as much as you put into it. And so I just really want to challenge all you guys. Um, let's hit this quarter with everything we got. Just three more months. That's it, right? It's a home stretch. Let's just, let's just give it all we got. Um, and, and also just another thing to be thinking as you guys are preparing your outreaches, um, and you're going to go on outreach. You're going to go to these different locations. You're going to be speaking in churches. You're going to be speaking to pastors and different church leaders and congregations. And they're going to be like, hey, teach us the Bible. Teach us the whole Bible. Teach, teach us the Gospel of John. Uh, teach us numbers. Uh, teach us the epistles of the Romans, right? They're, they're going to be asking all these things. And so, and you're going to get there and you're going to be like, okay, um, all I've done is I've just charted Romans. And you want me to teach Romans. Romans is one of the hardest books to teach. Okay. Um, and uh, and so and, and so just just as you go into this quarter, be thinking this is your outreach prep. This is your this is your prep work for outreach. The better you do on this homework, you're gonna be able to take this with you on outreach. And so like if you're thinking like okay, I might teach Romans, so I want to do the best I possibly can, and I want I want to chart Romans and I want to chart every single book as if I'm preparing my teaching. Right. This is your teaching prep right now. Right? So this quarter is teach prep. So just have that in mind as you go forward. Let's give it your all. Sorry, this was longer than I said. Um, you know, this was uh, originally this would be a three-hour teaching. I tried to I tried to stretch it down as, as much as I could. Uh, I got a little bit of tangents, but um, love you guys. Um, we will see you see you tomorrow uh, at the ceremony, welcome ceremony, and um, have uh, a wonderful weekend. Actually, we're gonna be we're gonna be in the kitchen this weekend. So you see, you see you guys there. Love you guys. Bye bye.